Hello and welcome to another episode of Katie the Science Lady. I'm Mrs. Jacobson. Today I'm joined by my college mascot, Sparky, and we are learning about the mechanisms of evolution. So let's learn together. Okay. We're going to quickly talk about different mechanisms of evolution, and in particular, we're going to talk about today gene flow, mutations, and genetic drift. Those are the three we're going to focus on. There are other mechanisms of evolution, but these are the three that are driving um, the main forces of evolution occurring. So the first thing is genetic drift. Now, it makes you kind of think of kind of something lazily floating around, and that's kind of what it is. Genetic drift is caused by random changes in allele frequency from generation to generation. Um, it is just kind of the way it goes. It's random. So this is based on chance events like natural disasters, and it ignores all adaptations. Here's what that means. Over time, things are going to happen to a population. Let's give me a population of bunny rabbits, for example. I'm sorry for what I'm about to do, these bunny rabbits. Wherever the bunny rabbits live on a forest, there will be natural disasters that occur. These natural disasters, like a forest fire, ignore adaptations. It, forest fire doesn't care what color a bunny rabbit is. Um, a forest fire doesn't care if a bunny rabbit has bigger or smaller ears. Um, all those little adaptations that may help a bunny rabbit survive from a predator won't help it in a natural disaster. So it will ignore adaptations. Natural disasters are random in how they change a population. So here are bunny rabbits again. And we'll say that we're looking at fur color because sometimes a brown rabbit in a forest can, can hide itself better than a white rabbit in a forest. The white rabbit will stick out more and predators are more likely to eat it. So in this case, those white bunny rabbits are not as fit for their environment as the brown bunny rabbits. But now we've got a forest fire. And let's say this happens here. We've got all these five bunny rabbits here. They die. So, sorry, but these four, five bunny rabbits, they died in the forest fire. So we're left with just these three brown bunny rabbits and these two white bunny rabbits. So even though it may have been less fit for the white bunny rabbits, because there was a natural disaster, they survived. Um, it was random, but they survived. So when they reproduced, we've got this second generation here. So even though it's not fit to have that white bunny rabbit gene, it gets reproduced, so we see it again. Um, however, we could have another natural disaster. Let's say there's an earthquake and a lot of trees fall off the bunnies. I'm so mean to these bunny rabbits. So another natural disaster happens. Only these two brown bunnies survive. That's it. The rest of them die horrible, sad bunny deaths to this earthquake. But it's a natural disaster, things happen. If only those two bunny rabbits survive and they're both dominant for brown fur, so there's zero chance of any of their babies having white fur. So we've gone from um, lots of different allele combinations here. We've had that little allele for white fur. It is completely gone after two natural disasters. So we are looking at random changes in the frequency of alleles in two generations. So this can happen in the natural world. It happens due to natural disasters with animals a lot. It can happen with um, things like shipwrecks. For humans, it can also happen when humans decide to um, remove themselves from the general population and only um, either intermarry or interbreed with each other. So an example of this would be Amish communities. Um, they tend to stay closely together and they're tight-knit communities and they don't have many outsiders that come in. It acts a little bit like a natural disaster where you're not getting new alleles, you only have those alleles um, and there you kind of get stuck with those um, alleles in there. And so you can get a higher percentage of alleles in that group than you would in a normal population. It results in a loss of genetic diversity. As we saw with the bunny rabbits, we had lots of different allele combinations. We had white bunny rabbits and brown bunny rabbits. I'm saying bunny rabbits a lot. Um, but over time, due to those two natural disasters and genetic drift, they're only big A, big A bunny rabbits. So the recessive allele got wiped out completely in that population. So they lost genetic diversity. And we saw that white allele, the little A, disappear completely. This can happen with humans as well. Um, you may have groups of people where um, blue eyes becomes incredibly, incredibly common. 
whereas the rest of the world, it's very rare. Um, you may have um, a group of people that have specific genetic conditions that are very prevalent in their community, but are very rare outside of the community. Um, for example, polydactyly or having more than five fingers on each hand or five toes on each foot is not very common. However, in certain um, kind of cloistered or grouped areas of humans, because they interbreed with only each other and they only have babies with each other, these alleles are more concentrated and you see them more. And so you may have a higher chance of these kind of rare genetic conditions because they've lost genetic diversity. Um, and you may have a higher chance of having those kind of negative alleles present. And we call this bottlenecking. So if we take this as the original population um, and you, let's say, shipwreck some of our humans on an island by themselves, we call that a bottlenecking event. Um, and then the surviving population, like we can see, there's no more yellow alleles. Um, there's only blue and one white allele. So the white allele becomes not very common, whereas in our normal population, it was pretty common. So it changes that percent that you see the alleles. This is currently happening to cheetahs um, because they have been hunted, um, because they have issues with reproduction. They have become they become so closely related to each other um, that any cheetah you see is going to be a very close relation to any other cheetah. Um, they're just very closely related because there aren't that many of them. So they're more prone to genetic conditions that can cause them to die. Um, and this is part of the reason why they are consistently um, endangered because of all these different things, um, because they've sometimes put themselves in a bottlenecking event. They don't tend to travel too much. They stick to themselves. Um, so they have a hard time repopulating um, because they don't have a lot of genetics to choose from. They're kind of stuck with what they have. Gene flow um, is another one of our mechanisms of evolution. It's the movement of alleles from one population to another. It's also the movement of organisms from one population to another. This is also called migration. Um, but we're looking at the alleles in particular, which means that for this to happen, an individual, so let's say a cow, a cow loses its herd. It wanders off from the herd. It crosses a river somehow and it gets lost. It joins another herd. It's like, oh, look, happy cow people. So it joins the other cow herd. That's not gene flow. Just because an organism moves from one population to another doesn't mean it's gene flow. For that to happen, they have to breed. So they have to have offspring in the new population because the alleles have to get transferred. If you just walk around, you're not transferring alleles, thank goodness. You have to have a baby to transfer your alleles. So when that cow joins that other herd and has cow babies, um, that's when we are experiencing gene flow in that population because it's flowing from one population to a different one. That's kind of the way I like to remember that. This increases genetic diversity in the new population because you have new genes and new alleles joining your population. It's usually a good thing. Populations overall become more similar to one another. Um, we can kind of see this a little bit. In our globe, we have I mean, 200 years ago, people couldn't travel. So people looked very, very different from each other. You had a lot of people staying within their same groups. We call it homo homogeneous. Um, people didn't often interbreed or intermarry or move to new places um, and have babies there. It just didn't happen all that much. But nowadays, people... We can travel the world. We can increase our genetic diversity. You can move to new populations. You can live in new places. Um, so we overall will become a little bit more similar to each other. And this means it's less likely for a new species to evolve. So because we are sharing all of our alleles, it means that we're going to slowly become more similar to one another. Not necessarily a bad thing um, because we're still sharing a lot of alleles and that variation is always good. So we see that here. A lot of times we had people that migrated um, to different areas. So due to that, that brought new traits into new areas of the world. So, I mean, that was a long, long time ago. And nowadays it's so much easier for gene flow to occur because we can jump on a plane. We can move our whole life to a new country, to a new group of people. Um, and again, you can have babies with anyone on any part of the planet um, because you're just changing populations whenever you want to. So gene flow is much easier for humans um, than it is for animals because of our transportation abilities. 
So we see that here. These are older pictures, obviously, and they represent people from all sorts of different cultures all over the globe. And the one thing that we notice about these people is their facial features look very different from each other. Um, hair color, eye color, even skin tone may be very different from each other. And that's because a lot of these people um, were in very isolated areas, or they may have been kind of stuck in their one section of the planet, which totally normal. Now over here, we see people that are made up of multiple different cultures, people with different cultural backgrounds that have um, had parents from either one, two, three, multiple um, different ethnic backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, and have a lot of different alleles making them up. And we can say that compared to this first picture, the people in the second picture look more similar to each other. They don't look the same by any means, but they look more similar because they've had a mixing of these alleles. Now, this is a very good thing in most cases. Um, it makes people more resistant to diseases. It keeps us from getting a lot of these genetic conditions. So typically, um, when you have more alleles coming together, it's very, very good for a species and for populations across the world. The last thing we need to talk about are mutations. We've talked about how mutations occur, um, when they happen, but we haven't talked about them as kind of an evolutionary force. Lots of our evolutionary forces, like gene flow, cause a loss of diversity over time. They tend to make everything look a little bit more similar, um, especially because you pick fit traits. So if you have a disease that causes death at an early age, that's not going to be passed on because you're not going to be able to have children. So only the fittest traits are selected for. Mutations add new variations. So when you have a mutation, it adds new variety into the mix. So it causes more diversity. Again, a good thing. They can be beneficial, neutral, or disastrous. So a disastrous mutation would cause death in most cases, or a disease that um, is incurable, or something that would be very difficult to survive. A neutral mutation um, for humans is something, a lot of times like eye color, there could be an eye color mutation. Um, because eye color doesn't really help you survive better, um, it's pretty neutral. Beneficial would be having a resistance to a certain disease, um, having resistance to certain conditions. That would be beneficial for humans. For animals, coloring is a lot of these things, but depending if they can blend into their environment, how well you can survive could be dependent on a mutation. So here we've got our basic of a mutation. We may have a point mutation where A changes to a C, Again, remember that's a substitution mutation where you swap out one base pair for another or one base for another. And something small like this could cause a color shift. Um, in this case, it could cause our peppered moth, um, which we have here, this kind of whitish moth, to change into a black moth. So this is something that occurred a long time ago. We have, a, it's called the peppered moth, um, and it typically was found in the white form. The black form was a mutation. And typically, they didn't survive very well. These peppered moths, they lived on the trunks of trees that were whitish. And these peppered moths blended in very, very well if they were the whiter color, um, which meant that if you were the blacker colored moth, you tend to get eaten because you can be seen on the tree trunk. Just wasn't a very good mutation. Then um, we had a wave of the Industrial Revolution where smog was in the air, smoke was in the air, ash was everywhere. And these trees turned black. So then the black moths could hide very well. They could hide in their environment. And then the white peppered moths got eaten by birds. So depending on the environment, a mutation can be beneficial or disastrous. And that can change quickly. Um, if a trait is fit or not, isn't an absolute thing. It's not always a good thing. Um, things can change very quickly. So coloration especially is one where during a summer month, um, a white fur may be not beneficial, but during a winter month, white fur may be very beneficial. You would blend in very well from predators. So it just depends on your environment how fit a trait can be. While we could talk about many different mechanisms that help drive evolution, we're going to focus on three specific ones today. Gene flow is the first that we'll focus on. In gene flow, an organism leaves a population, joins another, and reproduces. This is going to add new traits into a new population. It's essentially just like you moving to a different country, getting married and having babies. Uh, you would be adding new genes to that gene pool. The second mechanism that we'll talk about are mutations. 
Now, mutations, we know they can be good, bad, or neutral, but essentially mutations allow for variation in a population. They allow for a variety between members of the same species. And this variation can make some members of the species more fit for their environment. If you're better fit for an environment, you're going to survive better. Um, and that gives you a chance to reproduce and pass on your traits. That's the big key here of evolution. We're looking at things that are going to either mix up the traits that are being added, add new traits to a population, or ensure that a specific trait um, is allowed to continue, especially if it's beneficial. Um, that will help the population and the species survive ultimately over time. Finally, the last mechanism we'll talk about today is genetic drift. Genetic drift is caused by kind of random chance. Um, it can be caused by natural disasters. It can be caused by isolationism by humans. Um, if we separate ourselves from the main group, the main population um, in some way, whether shipwreck or um, there may be, again, natural disaster that may cause that to happen. Or if a certain group of humans only interbreeds um, with each other or has children in the same group um, in tight-knit communities, this happens a lot. Now, genetic drift may cause certain alleles to be far more common in a small population than they would be in general in that species. For example, if blue eyes are common in maybe one-fifth of the general population, I know that's really high, they're not that common, but if a group of people with mainly blue eyes get stuck together, their children are going to have a high, high chance of having blue eyes. So if they get shipwrecked on a deserted island, 90% of those children may have blue eyes compared to the normal population having maybe 20%. Again, that's really high. Blue eyes are fairly rare nowadays. But that's how genetic drift can work. It can make the frequency or the kind of percentage that an allele is going to be present much higher or much lower than it would be in a general population. Well, I know that was kind of a lot, and it's pretty technical stuff that we're talking about today, um, but I hope you stuck in there pretty well. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you have any questions or need anything from me. And as always, I hope you had fun, I hope you learned something, and I'll see you later.